two meals a day now, and it's good food. They have a priority on saying, you're not just here to eat, eat whatever's left over from the rest of the community. You're here to get nutrition so you can go out and deal with your life. And that's so precious. And also, this particular person has been my role model as I've started here. She has massive amount of time in, in the field, working individually with people. She is smart on an individual level to help people get from one step to the next step to the next step. And she's smart on the political level, which a lot of service providers work on that human space, but they don't see the political barriers that is making their lives, frankly, hell. So I go to this woman for my sustenance. I'd like to present Celeste West. Thank you so much, Adrian. I was over there getting a little ticked off because, you know, we're kind of at the end of the program here. Um, and, you know, I have to let go of that. I'm just honored to be here. I want to give a shout out to Homeless Action and the other sponsors of this event. Yeah, let's, let's do that. As well as, as well as the Center for Spiritual Living, which is my spiritual home that is providing a space for us to do this. And then I cannot move on with what the 10 minutes I have, probably nine now. Uh, I really want to give a shout out to the women of the living room, the TLR participants who are here today. Yes, yes. Our women are out there. Our women are active, active, and they're doing things and making things happen and showing up over and over and over again. So, uh, I, there's so much to say. There's so much <laughs> uh, So I was at home last night and I ran across this video that was on my laptop. And I want the voices of the living room to speak. And this is a video that was done in 2015. It was done for a uh, ASK event, but it was really, it's very moving. So here we go. So, uh, of course, when I had any baby, I was like, well, where are we going to go? And they told me about the living room. And I think it's awesome that they have separate, that where the kids play and where the adults stay. Because it's, it's supportive of for a kid's environment. My son has um, temperamental issues from my use when I was pregnant. Uh, he has behavioral issues. And everybody here is very supportive. He is very energetic. He, um, doesn't always listen on the first time, and the staff here is so supportive. I mean, he, it's just a really nurturing environment. So through the living room, they have um, paid for me, sponsored me to get therapy, which I'm currently enrolled in, and uh, seems so far to be really successful. I'm getting a lot of, um, a lot of help through that. Had I not had that, um, so every day is, is another day working on my sobriety. I had worked all my life and I became disabled and um, my disability got so much worse at one point that I couldn't work and I basically lost everything. The first night I spent in a shelter um, about four and a half years ago, um, the first thing you hear about is the living room. There's a lot of services here, obviously. I mean, they have stretched that money just as far as it can go. Um, and that's usually something that's promoted here. But the part that I got um, that was more important to me was the unconditional love. It's in my heart, most definitely. It's, it's part of who I am now, and I'm better for it because up until coming here and feeling this kind of safety in the midst of total crisis is just, I mean, that's a, that's a gift. It's a definite gift. I 
at the living room, we really work on getting people to the point where they are resilient enough to deal with their situation, whether they're homeless or couch surfing, at risk of being homeless. So we do what it takes for that individual to be able to pull their lives together, basically. So we feed them, we give them resources that help with medical needs and that sort of thing. But overall, we're, we're dealing with getting them to be able to be self-reliant and independent. I'm originally born and raised in San Francisco. Came here to Sonoma County 10 years ago. And uh, about last year, about the same time, I lost my daughters um, due to um, addiction to drugs. And I lost my car, my apartment, in Section 8, um, and my daughters. I kind of found it a, a great place for me to come with and meet with other women and then tell my story in the hopes that I can help um, other women stay in recovery if, or if they want recovery, they can come and talk with me and I can tell them my story about my now going on nine months clean and um, I'm very close uh, to getting my daughters to come home. I say that mom needs to be homework. And that's what I'm doing because I don't want them to, you know, they they know a little bit about what's going on, but not a lot of it. So I want to keep their innocence. And I just said, Mom's doing a lot of homework. And when Mom does the big test, then the, when the big test gets the A, then you get to come home. I was devastated because we had nowhere to go. We thought we were going to sleep in our car, which I, we ended up doing, sleeping in our car and maybe camping out for a night because we had nowhere to go. And, uh, and also, we, we, sometimes if we don't have food or diapers, um, I come here and this was the first place that I went to. Became the mothers here are a support system for everybody. We all support each other. And, you know, we're all friends. And I'm really happy for that. I really do feel safe here. I'm now uh, living out of my car on the streets of Santa Rosa. Um, and I found the living room. Um, and they say they really actually saved my life. I didn't know how to be homeless. Um, the living room, they, they feed you a breakfast and then and, and lunch. And I remember the first time I had a meal there, I literally started crying because it was just like eating a home cooked meal, you know, that your mom would make you. And and the women embracing you, um, letting you know everything's going to be okay. It's not that bad. And um, there's a lot of support. Oh, it's just for women, and they have counselors, and anything you need, they have the answer for. But you need to do the footwork, you know? So, I was blessed I found this place. Um, I really, I don't know where I'd be. Living room is a safe harbor for women who are in transition and kids. And it is that safety net that is absolutely necessary. If the living room wasn't here, there would be a lot of women and children walking around the streets. Um, homelessness is a reality. Um, it's something that um, is today and very real. There's a lot of women with young children who don't have a father to support them or help them in making a life for themselves. And so their choice is to live in shelters, and these shelters put these babies out on the street at 8 o'clock in the morning. If it wasn't for the living room, they would have no shelter um, during the day. The living room wasn't here. I don't know what I would do. So I don't know where I'd be if I didn't come here. I really don't. But without the living room, um, I, I honestly don't think I would have made it. So this was done in 2015, and um, some of these women are housed now, and some of them um, have moved on, and some of them are still around. And I thought it was really important to hear their voices. Uh, 
I just want to talk a little bit about alliances because that's one of the things we're talking about here is networking, about new ideas, about this, how this new money is going to be spent. You know, let us not forget that we need each other and that, you know, sometimes I feel like uh, service providers kind of get a bad rap because we're doing this day-to-day -day work. We're operating a shelter. We're operating programs. We've moved into uh, starting two new housing programs in less than a year. I didn't hear about that. Uh, and, you know, and on, thank you. And on one of these, one of these um, spots that we have that mainly have senior women in it, and we have some women here who are now in our Carrillo house, you know, which is right on the campus. But guess what? We got a tiny house too. <laughs> we have a tiny house on the link, on the uh, the link house, uh, the link property. So I mean, we keep trying to stand with our allies, stand with homeless action, stand with the providers, stand with each other, because it's going to take all of us, every bit of what we're doing, to keep moving this forward. So I'm going to end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celeste. That's a, a segue for us really to say there is an effort to make a coalition of people who give presentations here, some of you, other people who didn't make it into this room. If we go to, the, to that continuum of care board as a group and say this is what we want funded, there's much more chance that some of it at least will get funded. So uh, Joan's going to be talking about the I Belong and there's stuff in your, your folder about what you could do following up. So we'll get to that. But right now I want to introduce Michael Nesta. Michael Nesta. Michael. Yeah. He, he works on behalf of St. Vincent de Paul as the Director of Disaster Relief. And he has spent the last two months helping to register vehicles that belong to homeless people. Let's give it up for Michael. He's coming. He's coming, he's coming. Our Michael. Okay, our oh, Michael. Yeah. We love Michael. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, if there's anybody that's hard of hearing or just likes reading stuff, I brought some printouts. And I was going to put it on the screen, but I think I'll just follow suit with everybody else and just talk to you. Well, um, I want to thank Adrian, Catherine, and Gregory because the vehicle registration program that I did um, would not have been possible had they not brought it to St. Vincent de Paul to ask for our help. And um, when I came to St. Vincent de Paul not more than two months ago to begin working there as a disaster relief uh, manager, I didn't know I was going to be working with vehicles. I didn't know that I would have to be on Apollo Way every day for two months. Um, <laughs> I thought, you know, I was going to be helping people with furniture that their houses burned down and it was going to be cut and dry paperwork, but no, that actually wasn't the case. So um, I had to put the house in a box program that helps fire victims on hold. And essentially what I began doing was hitting the pavement with Gregory, Adrian, and Catherine and collecting information on anybody that was there living in their car who I saw that the tag wasn't blue. Essentially, that means that they're not registered, that if the cops or any other you know, enforcement agency is to stop them, they can lose their vehicles. So it was St. Vincent's goal from the outset to help as many people as we could get either registration or smog or driver's license fees or insurance paid for. Now, you know, I wish it was the case that we didn't have uh, an imminent deadline that, you know, the city had whispered to me a few times that September and mid-September would be a cleanup of Apollo Way. And I had, you know, no idea really how it was going to be that I was going to help upwards of 60 people that were out there um, within the time span of a month. So what I did and much to, you know, follow what the last, the speaker before last said is the human connection. And I don't think any of the work 
I did would have been possible if I wasn't just spending time with people. And you know, the people that had their cars registered, I unfortunately couldn't help, and the people that had, you know, problems that surmounted huge dollar amounts that St. Vincent couldn't cover, we, you know, we couldn't help everybody. But if you by any chance get one of the handouts I made, you'll see that there was about 65 or 70 people, vehicles, that did go to Apollo. They either stayed there or they didn't. And um, with the numbers that I keep on a document for myself, we actually have been able to give upwards of 30 um, different clients money to help them get their cars registered, smogged, or insured. And there's probably some people in this room just from seeing their faces that are completely compliant now that, you know, the month is over because I see one of them in the back and, you know, we've helped replace things as simple as windows that were bashed out or radiators that don't work anymore. And I guess that took a little bit of know-how um, just having been around, you know, vehicles myself for a while. But um, I was going to come up here and show you numbers and talk about that stuff, but I think that one of the more important things is that I just wanted to help. Um, I lived in my car when I was in college, not because I needed to. I'm sure I could have taken out a loan that would have put me in debt for the next 10 years, but I didn't want to, and I was kind of okay with it. But the reason I say that is because I can understand how just living in your car and having those glances come at you from people you've never met before on a day-to-day -day basis can start to isolate you, not in reality, but in your own mind. And the, the pain that it causes is not easy to see on the outside when you feel it inside. You feel like, if I'm going to go into this business, are they going to stare at me and know I live in my car? Um, just stuff like that. So, you know, I didn't have all the money in the world, and I hear of all the, you know, crazy figures that is spent in counties trying to help people, and if I had anything like that, I would have bought everybody a brand new car, to be completely honest. But I only had $13,000 to start with, and unfortunately some of the registration you know on an old rv that hasn't been in in the system for 10 years is almost 800 900 dollars so that's 10 people so what i was doing was pinching pennies and working with local local businesses and insurance companies and you know the good thing is that i had help from people like the smog center where she volunteered to do free smog for some of the clients because she her name was kat she's a Ger german woman who runs the business she loved what we were doing. Um, Allstate Insurance helped us. Um, Ted Smog, they were willing to do a bunch of work and then get a check at the end of the month and just taking me on my word. I think that they deserve thanks. Um, as well as a lot of other companies, there was batteries that needed to be bought for people to be able to charge their RVs um, and you know run them as houses. And we got you know commercial discounts for that. Um, the last thing I wanna say is, you know, not everybody loves the police, and I can understand that. It's hard, too, when um, there's an obvious lack of, of human connection between you know, citizens and law enforcement, because everybody's given a different role in their day-to-day, -day, whatever their job is or their life is. Um, but one of the things I did do on, I think on my behalf and um, the behalf of everybody I was working with, like Greg and um, Catherine and Adrian is when I was compiling spreadsheets on everybody's progress, I was sending it to the sergeant of the PD so that he would know who to lay off of. And obviously, you know, if I had the money, I would have told him to lay off of everybody, but there was only so many people I could have in a pipeline. And as many of you know that run your own projects, aligning services with somebody on different facets of a project can be kind of time consuming. Not to mention, I was also doing house in a box while I had free time. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's all I really got to say. Um, if I ever get a chance to do something like this again, I'm going to, you know, have the experience now um, to know who to go to when I need something taken care of. And um, it really, you know, it took about a month before I could start dispersing funds. And it feels pretty good to cut a check and give it to somebody and see them either smile or um, just say thank you. Um, and like I said, I just wanted to help. That's it. Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure to work with Michael and St. Vincent's. Sometimes it's really nice to have a, 
an organization that has a big name. You know, it, they can get things because people trust them, and, and that's really great to have companions along the way. So um, we're going to wrap this up soon. Some of you will not be disappointed. You will be like, okay, when? So I'm going to tell you. Um, we have a lot of food left. So if you're homeless in particular, but if you're poor or if you just dang, need another sandwich for supper, go over there and get some. There's some, some wrapping paper and you can make it. Um, we have a couple of really, we have one quick uh, presentation and then I'm going to bring Scott up for just a few minutes more. So Teddy, I want you to come up here if you can. Um, Teddy has it outside the box. This is not about heap funding. This is about another kind of funding. Thank you very much, Amy. <laughs> Small business funding. Okay. I just wanted to let everyone know that um, my, I Pardon? Up here? Okay. Close, but it close. Really close? Yeah. Really close, because you know we were practicing and it wasn't that close a couple days ago. I, uh, I have a background in data. I was the county's HMIS manager, and for each, if anyone knows what that is, that's the Homeless Management Information System. And I've been involved in capacity building for many, many years. I'm thrilled that the state of California is pushing out all this government money, but like people have mentioned earlier, it does come with a lot of regulations and strings. I happen to believe that the private market would be interested in investing in creative homeless projects like I've heard all day long here today. So my project for next year is to begin uh, putting together kind of an incubation system for creative homeless projects. I would love feedback. I'm going to do three sets of discovery between November 1st and December 31st um, to help people, help me build an organization based on human-centered design, which is also the recurring theme I've heard here all day long. Get the humans, get the people who are experiencing the problem, help identify the problem, let's prototype some solutions for a problem. To that end, I would love to throw this out to people. I'm looking for three sets of folks to either meet with in a focus group setting or to interview you one-on-one. -on -one. The first group would be folks out of the advocacy community or lived experience people. And so anyone who'd, love, who'd like to help out um, just giving me ideas or critiquing my own ideas, I'd be into that. The second group would be uh, homeless service providers. And the third group would be potential private funders. I understand where the government money, how that works. I used to monitor the government money for Community Development Commission. But if you could help me by either uh, letting me know that you'd be interested in just giving me your opinions or telling your friends, I will be in touch with you in the next couple of weeks to start setting some of this up. The idea is to build a capacity center for homeless specific programs so that that project has credibility and structure going forward. I think you'll be more fundable on any level when you've got that kind of backing. So thank you and just Adrian knows how to reach me. Okay, this is the moment where we're going to do the woo-woo stuff. Ground yourself. Send your energy out into the world. Billionaires. Millionaires. Come to Come. All right. Scott. Scott Wagner. Let me see what I got out here. We've asked him to come back and talk just a little bit more about the role of services in the homelessness landscape. And I want to say, uh, we have to leave this room pretty quickly after 5 o'clock. So anyone who could stay and help us wrap up the food and take stuff to our cars and all that, we'd really, really appreciate it. Are you ready, Scott? I think so. Okay. Scott Wagner. Hi, again. I wanted to just very briefly uh, <coughs> plug your points. Uh, just, just from the simple math, I know that many of you have not provided any input here. I challenged each of you to take one idea or one thought and just put it up. And I guarantee you, we will get this information to decision makers. We're going to collate it. Um, this is something the city actually, and the CDC does a lot when they do public gatherings, is they take everything and put it in a big list. We'll do that here too. Um, and, and can treat those as kind of like votes. Services are kind of what we've been talking about. And I just want to give you a flavor for the model or the approach that we want to do with good, supportive services in a given village. 
And you can see that here, let's take the first and the most important one, is that when someone comes into a situation, that they're diverted from their former life and they're taken good care of. You know, the, the process of diversion is actually a, a, a process that has been started by the Gates Foundation. It's a really good idea, and it basically just means really good case management for as long as it takes to stabilize people and get clear on what it is they really need. And then every individual in that village can then be uh, kind of subscribing to various services that are available to them. Now here, you see that the X means that this particular service is delivered on site and it's delivered by residents. It's not delivered off site in general. And as you go down, and I'm not gonna go through these whole things, but you can just see that there are these kind of, there are a myriad of details that make, make a successful human being for all of us. Um, because each one of these things actually is, is something that we need too, whether we're housed or not. But this is a formal way to help these people. Can you bring it down just a little bit? Oh, sorry, yeah. All right. That's okay. Yeah. And then, um, but you'll see, as, you'll see as you take a look here, you'll see that there's a lot of residency that's involved. And this is really about peers. This is tying back to the notion of community, of what community is and what the miracle of community is. It's not a slogan. It's not, a, it's not a romantic idea. We need peers, we need our fellow citizens to help us. And so you see there that the, the residents themselves are really, really integral in any successful village. Now then down at the very bottom, here I have just some sources of funding and support. And these all need to get tied into the various services because we need money, typically, not always, because sometimes it's just volunteers and sometimes it's residents. But we do need money for things like mental health services and for certain education services and for help from the VA and so forth. But look at all the different sources that we have. They don't all fit on the page here. There are many, 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 many different places that we need to be going to get money to make this happen. And we're not doing that right now. This is one of my real pet peeves and I'm, I'm heartbroken a lot because I'm I'm stuck on the streets or I'm stuck in politics and I can't get out there and deal with the donation uh, depth that we need in all these different varieties. But, um, you know, I can send these to you if you'd like. But you can see that city general fund and county general fund, in my opinion, total about 15% of what we should be spending. And the people don't usually think that way. They think the city and the county have to fix it. Okay, that's a myth. The city and the county are, are one small layer on top of many others that we need to, to go with. And I only want to mention one because it's important and people don't think about it enough. And that is hospital public benefit funding. Now hospitals have, they are nonprofit, but the reason why they're nonprofit is because they're supposed to be spending the money that they would spend on taxes to benefit the population that they serve. And and as it happens, the three, the three hospitals that we have in the area, they do do public uh, benefit funding, but it's quite anemic. And it's not targeted towards the homeless, which is a core, core uh, system. So I'm looking for help from others to work on teams to get that done. If you have any insights or experience with that, please contact me directly. And that goes for all these other fundings too, for that matter. Let's work on it together. Let's get the money portion of this taken care of. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, that was the end of our third round of presentations. And we're just gonna take a couple of minutes here. Um, maybe, are there any things anyone would like to share out to the whole group um, about their experience today, what they've learned, or any comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think there's been tremendous ideas, tremendous. I think I learned something from everybody here. 
um, whether you're sitting in the crowd here in the audience or if you're a speaker. And I think it'd be great if we could collaborate. You're asking some, asking for money, you're asking for money. Let's all get together and look at the resources and ask for money. Instead of doing here and here and here, let's do it together. Let's just collaborate. You know, sh show the government how to collaborate by doing it ourselves. And then we can go to them stronger as well. That's what I would like to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thomas, okay, you, you can be next to So I just wanted to underline something Celeste said, that providers who work in the stakeholder systems that our people end up in are extraordinarily hardworking and caring. And one of the things that I would like to see us focus on together with all the new funding and the programs that we end up developing in our county is the building in of uh, sustainable care and support for providers because uh, it's one of my favorite uh, stats to roll off my tongue. Um, SAMHSA says that no one working with this population that we're together about today should have a caseload of more than 12 to 15 people. So at Behavioral Health, the caseload is 80 to 100, right? So I wanted to just add that in. Okay, now don't forget to put that up on services. Can you make a note, make sure it gets up on services? That's, that's the kind of stuff that, that we need to take note of. Hi, well I wanted to thank uh, Homes Action for actually taking that step to go to the Human Rights Commission and have Kevin Jones come here um, that I think can be produce a great result. It sounded a bit anemic what he said, we gave it to these people and we talked to these people and um, I would like to see them along with us formulate a strategy to have them take their demands to the uh, civil grand jury, the Sonoma County civil grand jury, because a lot can be produced from that. When you go to the civil grand jury, the civil grand jury uh, it's required of each department to respond to them specifically of how they will address whatever the civil grand jury comes with. So when the Human Rights Commission demands that from them, they will respond. Thank you. Thank you. So take, a, take about two minutes, write something on one of those post-its. Who are our um, staff people? If you have a post-it, Go, hold it up and we'll come take it from you and put it up for you. Okay. And before you leave, put another dot on the um, chart out by the wall, but please don't leave yet. We have our... Um, Adrian, are you here? Yes. Pardon me? I just wanted to say one other thing. I, when I was talking about the homeless court, I wanted, I neglected to mention Jones. All of you are homeless, that you can refer to her, she will fight for you. She's, mm. she's terrific. So I just wanted to let you know that you There is a public defender for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, you're all real troopers. <clears throat> um, four and a half hours is, is a long time. Thank you for sticking with us. I, I hope you came away with some inspiration and ideas from all of our wonderful presenters. Apparently <clears throat> my voice is thinking it's a long time too. Um, so what we want to do is, you know, when you're with a group of people, if you've gone to conferences before, what, what you notice is that it's easier to feel inspired and energized by what you've heard. And, and our brains kind of um, entrain with each other somehow. Like if, so if we're all trying to work together and go in the same direction, that it kind of, we help each other, lift each other up. And then when we go back to our daily lives, it's kind of like those, those wagon tracks along the dirt roads where it's easy to fall back into old habits. So thinking about that, we've made um, some resources for you, how to stay connected and stay engaged and, and what you can do if you're moved to want to do something to help. And um, so here are some next steps. These are mostly all in your packet, but 
Um, this is just from today. You can find the HEAP funding information worksheet that we put in your packet. Um, you can use the event flyers in your folder to see what's coming up next. And to generally stay in touch, I, I highly recommend Homeless Actions calendar and weekly Monday meetings. That's kind of where I go to get the scoop. <clears throat> There are a couple of specific things <clears throat> that are coming up in the next three weeks that I'd like to call your attention to. And that is uh, on October 18th that we've mentioned it before, the meeting at the CDC and COC for talking about how that heat funding, that 12.1 million is gonna get um, distributed for emergency homeless projects in Sonoma County. And then on October 24th, we're having the first Community Resilience Network. And this is a monthly group for groups who want to link and leverage the resources we have, kind of like June was talking about, and, um, and focus action on the collaboration. This is a very action-oriented group where we focus on solutions and taking action on them. And then finally, we have this November 3rd meeting of Small Housing Solutions in Seattle. I'm hearing about those from Sharon Lee, who is the ED of the Low Income Housing Institute in the Seattle area. And she's going to be coming to speak with us. Uh, and the meeting will be at the um, Santa Rosa City Council Chambers. And the time is still TBD, so you're going to want to check that calendar. Use the link that's in your packet and, and check in to find out when the time is if you'd like to be there. And finally, I want to say a little bit more about the Community Resilience Network. It's a collaborative process that works. So talking about collaboration, like it sounds good and exciting, and then you get in there and do it, and sometimes it can be really tough. So <laughs> this is a process that supports collaboration, and I'm really excited to announce um, that we have a new partner. Can you back it up a little bit, Catherine? Or one slide? Yeah. To the next one? No, yeah. one before. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to announce that the Purdue Agile Strategy Labs has agreed to partner with our organization. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, that's right here, and, the, and you can see there's their logo. This is the I Belong Project. This is all volunteer-based uh, project for creating connections, like um, Kalia and some other of our presenters were talking about how important those are. And it's generously funded by a grant from the Taoist Institute. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Someone said cool. <laughs> I think it's cool uh, to have all this great support. So we're, we're convening on October 24th, and we're going to collaborate in new ways. We're going to teach our brain new skills, so it'll be a little bit hard, you know, like it is when you learn something new. But it'll be exciting, too, because you're going to see that you can make progress when you work in this new way. And um, my, my partners are going to be um, talking with me. They have experience working in Flint, Michigan. They've been there for seven years. They have experience working in Puerto Rico. They just went there last year. And uh, they also work with people like Lockheed and NASA to bring in the bucks, you know, because <laughs> Puerto Rico and Flint don't pay, pay that much. Uh, actually, I actually think they do it pro bono. So um, if you are interested, we're also going to, everybody who comes is going to contribute by completing simple actions in, within an agreed upon time frame. And we're going to focus on what we can do with what we have. We're not going to talk about problems because nothing ever gets solved by when you're sitting around talking about problems. And um, of course you need to acknowledge what, what the problems are, what the challenges are like we did in the beginning, but talking about them doesn't really get us anywhere. Uh, and everybody who wants to show up needs to want to participate in creating a safe space for respectful dialogue like we did today. And trust the process because I've seen it work and I've got some very experienced people who are partnering with us to help us make it work. Uh, and, and so if you could move the slide along. The question that we're gonna ask at our first Community Resilience Network is Imagine a world where our children and our grandchildren don't have to have this challenge of homelessness, of people living on the streets hanging over their head. How can we create that future? 
and, and that's what that's going to be our focus question. And th there might be different groups that have different interests in um, how to create this future. Some might be interested in the service component. Some might be interested in the capital component. And there's also a group that's interested in the private funding component. So I'm going to be talking with Teddy there, who's working on this uh, incubator project. So thank you all so much for coming in. We're going to have Adrian, the grand dom, or however you say that word, close us out for the day. <laughs> I'll do one of those uh, uh, elderly English women who are actresses, right? The grand dom. Uh, thank you. Thank you especially if you are homeless or at risk of homeless. We had presenters today who couldn't really come because it was just too intimidating, too hard, too traumatic. I don't know. But I do know it's hard sometimes for us to come into a room with somewhat strangers and, and take part in the community. So any of you who had that feeling before you walked in the door, I hope you have it not when you go out. <laughs> And I want to note, uh, on the back wall, as you came in, we asked you to put your hopefulness uh, sticker. And I would like you to do it as you go out. There's a new chart. And we're going to see if we've raised a little hope here today in each of you. But be honest. Don't try to please Adrian. <laughs> okay, put up two. So, yeah, everybody gets two because you stay till the end. Yes. Um, I just want to thank our sponsors again. Uh, the I Belong Project, Jillian's Project, one of the first people to come in, the Living Room, the Community Action Coalition, and the Democratic Socialists of America. But right away, we couldn't have done it. And um, yeah, I like to go out singing, and I tried to get some song leaders here, and I just wasn't successful. But I feel like there is someone here in the audience who can help lead us in the song. And I don't care if the song is We Shall Overcome or <laughs> There's Another World in the Future. Uh, is there anyone here who is willing to come up here, take this mic, and lead us? Victoria. Victoria. <laughs> oh, Victoria. What's the well, the bull weevil said to the farmer, I gotta have a home. Just looking for a home. And then we have, um, ain't got no home and no place to roam. Ain't got no home or no place to roam. I'm a little frog and I got no home. Da -da 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 but at, at Homeless Action, we've been singing Carol King. So far away, doesn't anybody stay in one place anymore? It would be so fun to see your face at my door, but it doesn't help to know you're so far away. One more song about moving along the highway. Can't do much of anything that's new. If I could only work this life out my way, I'd rather spend it here, being close to you. But you're so far away. And then there's a line that says, um, um, all right, <laughs> something about she doesn't want to lose herself by being on the road too long. Then she'll never be able to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, Victoria, Victoria. All right, you are released back into the wild. Go so propagate, be fertile, and come back. Oh, all right, don't forget. So come back to the next meeting. We'll talk some more. Thank you, everybody. Yes, we do need help. Any help you can give us plenty of food, take some home. What about, what about,